civility and civil discourse are to mean anything in the 21st century. They can't be too nice and polite and mild to take on the hard problems and the open questions in our midst. They need to become muscular and adventurous enough to meet this moment. Heather McGee and Matt Kibbe, I see as bridge people across the social ruptures, the breaches of this moment. And I suspect that that's true of everybody in this room. I suspect this is a gathering of bridge people, which is a pretty exciting thing to be part of. Um, these two model a particularly 21st century way of, of being that. They, they hold deep passion and conviction, and that coexists and, in fact, is in a creative interplay with an enthusiasm, an enthusiasm for engaging difference, and they carry their questions as openly and vigorously as they carry their answers. They also both do a lot of refreshing truth-telling, both to the culture at large and within their own communities. And from where I sit, despite all the post-game analysis and breaking news of the last few months, um, we've had far too little searching analysis of what went wrong on every side and how good people with pains and fears and promise are on every side of that failure and on every side of the possibilities emerging now to create the realities we want to inhabit. So let's just plunge into this. Um, I just want to know before we, just as we start, um, you know, I just say, I, I like to hear a little bit, and Heather, maybe start with you about where you grew up and the roots in your life, the early roots in the background of your life, to, not to your positions, but to this sensibility that you carry, that you embody. Thank you so much. That is um, a really great question. It's always good to start at the beginning, and we so seldom yeah. do. Yeah. Um, so I grew up on the south side of Chicago um, in a sort of post-civil rights, uh, beginning of Reagan era moment where in some ways the movement had just become a daily part of life. There was a sense when I was growing up that all of our hands were still needed to push uh, and keep the world turning in the right direction for black people and other folks who struggled. My mother was a um, holistic healer at the time, so she was this sort of uh, alternative doctor, really before that was very popular on the south side of Chicago. Um, and I was a vegetarian, it was terrible, I ate tempeh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Alice Waters, but it was a terrible <laughs> thing to have to grow up that way in the early 80s. <laughs> Nobody wanted to trade school lunch with me. Um, and uh, when I was um, six years old, my, my father uh, remarried and married a white woman who had um, grown up in a very interesting family, one of um, nine children uh, who had taken a vow of poverty. Um, to do social justice work. And um, I suddenly had white cousins. And I think that that experience early on in the sort of immediate integration of my family um, and the bonds of love reaching um, out of my, you know, very black South Side neighborhood uh, and, and expanding the notion of family across race was probably a pretty, mm. uh, pretty formative early event. Mm. Thank you. So I, I mostly grew up in, in rural Pennsylvania, but I was born in Florida, and, and I lived in Detroit actually during the, the, the riots because my dad was constantly being transferred from um, one dying Rust Belt factory to another. And, and, and as a result, I, I don't, I'm not sure exactly where my hometown is, but mostly in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And he was a Reagan Republican. He was... He was Pro Reagan before it was cool, and uh, we had some interesting conversations because, as young as thirteen, I, I discovered Ayn Rand and libertarian ideas, and and I was a very difficult child, and I drove my parents crazy. Um, but it, for me, um, finding people that that wanted to have a conversation about ideas when I was a kid was virtually impossible to do, and. And one of the reasons I'm such a romantic about technology and social media is I think, it, I think it's the great equalizer. Mm. It, it allows people to connect with each other. 
and, and share ideas that, that they didn't necessarily get from um, the boss. And the boss could be a professor, or the boss could be the, the Walter Cronkite on TV. And so I, was, I spent most of my youth wasted reading books because I couldn't find other people that wanted to talk about the same kind of stuff that I wanted to talk about. And part of that was moving all the time, and, and I was a very shy kid, so, so one of the, the upsides of that is I, I started forcing myself to do things I didn't want to do, like talk to other people. <laughs> okay, great. Um, I'm really glad we started there, too. Um, yeah, you know, you use the term rust belt, and I feel like it's so important for us to step back, even from the language we use, like how demeaning it is that we have defined places people come from in that way. Yeah. And, and that's just reflexive and unreflected. And I feel like in both of you, um, a lot of what you say and, and are out there talking about um, has to do with the fact that, uh, you know, the political landscape and what gets covered, in fact, is not what's really going on, that politics has become a, is a symptom. Um, so, and you know, again, you come at this from very different directions, but Matt, here's something you've written. Uh, it's important to understand that Trump is a symptom, not of a country that is inherently racist, sexist, or bigoted, as some have claimed, but of a political system that just doesn't work in a world where everyone is freer to think outside the establishment's box. Yeah, I, I, I think that Trump whether we like it or not, is, is part of the sky falling. And there's a paradigm shift going on, not just in American politics, but in, in, in culture, in how we get our knowledge, and how we get our news, and how we discover music. And, and, and it's very much disintermediated. It's democratized. It's, it's people doing things for themselves that they used to depend on some institution kind of to tell them what to do. And that hasn't happened in our politics. It's, it's, it's old and it's crusty and it's, it's all of these incumbents and, and interests that, that are protecting the status quo. And starting maybe with Howard Dean, but certainly Ron Paul, the Tea Party movement, um, Bernie Sanders, and now Donald Trump are, are very much outsiders railing against the status quo. And you know, some people call that populism. Um, I think it's, I think it's people um, all over the place discovering that that Washington has lied to them, that that it's a it's not it's not what they it's not what they say it is, and they don't do what they say they're going to do, and that's where all the rage against the machine comes from, and and I see a lot of similarities and differences between a Bernie Sanders stump speech and a and a Donald Trump stump speech. Mm -hmm. People are pissed. They know that the system's not working for them and they want to do something about it. Now, do I think Donald Trump is a rational response to that? No, but I'm, as, a, as a guy that was early roadkill on the Trump train, um, I'm now sort of interested in talking to some of my Trump friends to figure out what exactly is going on there. Mm -hmm. And Heather, you've been very focused on political dynamics now as symptomatic of deeper questions of meaning and identity. Um, something you said to Ezra Klein um, in his podcast uh, really struck me as very succinct. The political and economic status quo is particularly brutal for people considered the traditional democratic base, but who turned to Donald Trump for change. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that um, one place where Matt and I agree is that we are in a moment of great political realignment um, where the folks who are thought of as sort of the traditional progressive or democratic base, women, people of color, immigrants, young people, and economically struggling families of all races are just particularly ill-served by what's going on in Washington and state houses, and by what is going on in our economy. Half of American families, if they received a bill on their doorstep, couldn't pay it without going into debt or selling something. Uh, young people of color have seen the state become in their lives, at best, something neglectful, and at worst, a source of abuse. 
we have a generation that is more educated, more uh, engaged, more um, activist than any we've seen uh, actually in our history, certainly on the education front, and yet they're being told that we, the people, can't afford to make that golden ticket to the middle class affordable for them without them having to go into six-figure, five-figure debt. So the idea that the 2016 election wouldn't be about the establishment versus the status quo was for me, and within the progressive so-called base, was for me, um, it was just sort of crazy thinking to think that despite the Obama's popularity, their personal popularity with the progressive base, that a message that was more of the same would resonate, would be resonant with the people who were really, really suffering in this economy uh, and felt really, really alienated um, from the halls of power. I think it was a, it was, it was a major mistake. Mm. You often describe yourself as, I guess you're, you're at the front end of the millennial generation. Yeah. I'm like a millennial grandmother. Yeah. Or in, in <laughs> you're, the first... you're a millennial elder. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, uh, the millennial, a turn of century generation, as you say, a transformative mm -hmm. uh, generation, and um, and a generation that kind of saw its view of the world and the ground on which it was standing kind of unsettled, shifted mm -hmm. very rapidly and bluntly. Um, and you, you say also that, you, you've said that, that millennials' view of the world and the questions millennials are holding have been ignored even during a Barack Obama White House. Um, and one of the ways people define this generation is that it's the first generation in American history that will not do better than their parents. That's really aspirational. <laughs> um, um, but also this sense that, I, I think for you, that that millennials kind of in their, in their bodies carry at least the potential for a whole different experience of difference, right? That, that our country, this is beautiful language over years, our, this is a country where ancestral lines of all the world's communities have met and been offered the audacious promise that out of many we could become one people. But the idea that, you know, the language like intersectionality, the idea that this generation will be able to appropriate that and live that in a different way. Um. Yeah, I, this feels, um, this is just something that when I, when I took over uh, as the president of Demos uh, three years ago at the age of 33, um, we had the, the chance to say maybe we should change our name because an ancient Greek uh, word uh, is maybe not the most sort of consumer friendly, um, maybe makes us a little bit uh, obtuse in the public debate. Um, but Demos means the people of a nation, and it's the root word of democracy. And I truly believe that this country's great promise, the thing that truly makes it the possible home of a new world, is what is happening now and has happened since the Immigration Act of 1965. That there is someone in this country with a tie to every community on the globe and even though that is causing great political, economic, and social angst, I think that's because of a lack of leadership, not necessarily because of something inherently wrong. And I think there are sort of two visions in the world right now and in our politics of what we're supposed to do about that increasing racial and ethnic diversity. Is the reason why America is the place where we've all met so that we could compete here or is the reason that maybe, just maybe, the existence of so much proximity will finally allow us to accept our common humanity? And I think that our generation, the most diverse generation in American history, has the potential to see this country's possibly very beautiful destiny be made manifest. And I think if we were to do that here in this country, really give lie to the belief in a hierarchy of human value in this country, this country that was founded and codified that belief to a degree 
that we still feel today, then we will have proven that this country is exceptional. And you know, Matt, to your invocation of um, what the internet has made possible, you know, in the, in the larger context, um, we, all of us, are part of the first generation of humans who actually have the tools to think and act as a species. Mm -hmm. um, we don't always rise to that occasion. Um, I wonder how, as a libertarian, um, how this aspect of us and of the present, um, where, where that, how that resonates for you. So you, you can look at, at the internet and social media and you can see all the downsides and you can see the yeah. silos and, and the, don't ever read the comments on your Facebook page, by the way, it's, right. it's a devastating experience. But, but the, uh, the upside is, is really profound and I, I think quite libertarian. There's a cyber libertarian um, who I love because he happens to be what the... What do you say, a cyber, cyber libertarian? A cyber libertarian. Oh, I love that. Google that. Okay. <laughs> Uh, it's a guy named John Perry Barlow, and he was the lyricist for the Grateful Dead, and that's how I met him the first time. And of all things, we started talking about Frederick Hayek and Spontaneous Order, and he was one of the first romantics to talk about the potential of the Internet, and he talks about something called the right to know. And there's this great quote that I quote all the time from a couple years ago where he says that the right to know is the opportunity of anyone, anywhere, whether you're in the uplands of Mali or Midtown Manhattan to know everything about a subject of your choosing, only limited by your capacity to, to understand it. And that is the great radical equalization that comes from social media. And, and to Heather's point, I think this is the opportunity, particularly for young people, to grow up in a, in a very, I don't really like this word, but I can't think of a better word, in a very cosmopolitan way. Mm -hmm. You understand that there's all sorts of people with all sorts of uh, backgrounds and, and um, ethnic histories and all that stuff because of YouTube. And you don't have to have enough money to travel to the corners of the globe to realize that, that there's, there's lots of differences and, and there's lots of nationalities and lots of traditions that are different from our own, but, but you're used to that, it's normal that we're not all the same and you're not stuck in your tribe, in your hometown where, where you're never exposed to people that are different from you. Mm -hmm. And I think that's natural for young people and I think the, the, the way that they almost crowdsource community. They're in, the, they're in this hyper libertarian world where they can choose everything and, and, and do whatever they want and, and that makes them crave community. But those communities aren't necessarily the people that live across the street it could be a global community. It could be people from all over the place. And I think that, that's, that's profoundly disruptive, but I can't help but, but be optimistic about that dynamic. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, and, and also that kind of, this proximity, and, and a proximity and interdependence, which is un, unparalleled, uh, is also very stressful mm -hmm. for human creatures. Oh yeah, we're like, freaking out. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we're freaking out, right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I mean, that's one way to describe the political landscape now. Right. Um, I, like the, I like the idea that we are in the adolescence of our species, right? And that if you look at a map of the teenage, the, te the map of the teenage brain looks like a lot like the ma a map of the globe right now, which it, you know, has these flashes of brilliance and creativity and energy and also this incredible capacity for self-destruction and recklessness. Um, and the truth is also, Right now, a, you know, at both, if there are, t I hate dividing, you know, making anything a choice of two, but if there are two ends of the American political spectrum, um, or even generationally, uh, there is this openness, this capacity to, uh, to be, uh, you know, diversity is too small a word as well, right? But also there's a hardening on both ends. So Matt, you could very well I don't know if this happened. You know, it, it's conceivable that you might be invited to speak at a liberal arts uh, university and be booed off the stage, or 
It's possible. It's possible, yeah. I mean, that also is a feature of our life together now, and I, I, I wonder how the two of you make sense of that and what you offer up in terms of how we, how we all make sense of that and how we navigate that. So I think that um, things have gotten very complex, and um, with the, I think, really beautiful quotation that you gave, Matt, the ability to really know everything, we all experience information overload, mm -hmm. and the capacity to understand, to filter, to test things that you learn through mediated forms in the real world, through human connection, is something that we can't take for granted. Um, I was floored. I remember I was actually reading it on the subway on my smartphone. It was an article about a body of research that was showing how college students, um, because of their devices, had showed, um, uh, I think it was almost a 40% drop in empathy. Um, and it was because of just this simple thing. I mean, I'm sure there was more to it, but the most vivid example I saw that really resonated with me was before you had the world at your fingertips in your pocket, if you were sitting at a lunch table or waiting in line and there was a pause in your conversation, you couldn't just retreat into something that was deeply distracting and interesting. You would actually have to sort of re-engage with the person next to you, look them in the eye and find something else to say, as awkward as that is. But that that experience of having to sort of go back to people at a moment of non-stimulation um, is something that we could miss and accidentally have, have a profound effect on our brains and our characters. So I think that we both need to embrace the limitless possibilities of technology and reaffirm the limitless possibilities of another human being that you're next to in a room. And that is all the more, more important when the people that you might be next to in a room um, are different than you. How fascinating and interesting and bottomless that degree of knowledge could be. You know, as, as someone that's spent a good deal of my life doing community organizing, um, nothing replaces a face-to-face -face conversation. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the reasons that I, that I do conferences like this is that I've also discovered this, this really wild discovery that it's really hard to hate someone that you're talking to face-to-face. -to -face. <laughs> And the opportunity there is you could actually um, honestly discuss differences and, and, and maybe find common ground. And it, it helps to have a guy that was involved with the Tea Party with, with a you know, progressive operative um, and to create the sense that we're going to have a fight, right? Yeah. And, then, and then actually talk about something that, that we agree on. I think that's really cool because going back to your question, young people choose everything a la carte and they live in this 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 sort of radical world in that sense and then they come to politics and it feels like you're shopping in a mall in Caracas or something there's absolutely nothing on the shelf for young people and are almost offended by the idea that somebody that they don't know just decided that they get two choices and they don't like either one of them and so that's why that's why the system is is breaking apart mm -hmm. And, and we, should, we should get ahead of that, but part of getting ahead of that is, is getting people that don't think they have anything in common to sit down and actually have a conversation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you've said that one of your ins inspirations has been Saul Alinsky, who is also an inspiration to Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton, <laughs> um, the community organizer. Yeah. Um, Eric said yesterday, uh, tolerance is not nearly big enough a word. And I, I kind of think tolerance has helped get us to this place. Or it, it, I mean, we needed it in our toolkit, but it, we need other things in the toolkit. Because to, you know, and the, the, the definition of tolerance in the medical context is the limits of thriving in an unfavorable environment. 
Your tolerance is really about, I'll let you be in the room, I'll, I'll be in the room, and we'll endure each other. Um, and maybe, maybe in the 60s when we had this whole new level of difference, mm -hmm. integrating that into our sense of self, that was where it, that was a baby step. Um, but I, I'm curious about um, language that the two of you, language or ideas or images that, that you feel might be a, not a successor to tolerance, but the kind of robust companion we need to live into this potential of our age that, that we've been talking about. That's a really great question. You should have a very successful podcast. You really have a great, um, that's a really great question. Um, so, I have been thinking a lot lately um, about the ways that uh, the isms affect not just the subordinated groups, but the dominant groups as well. And um, in, in Brown v. Board of Education, right, the seminal civil rights case, um, it was a decision that rested on, um, and many folks will sort of remember this, um, some social science research about the harms to the self-esteem of black children of segregation. Some people may remember the doll study, right, that nobody wanted a brown doll because it was so clear even to young children that that was an inferior skin color. There was a lower court case before it got up to the Supreme Court that also relied on social science research talking about the harms to white children of growing up in a society where A, they hear all these ideals about equality and liberty and opportunity and justice, and yet are also given the lesson of hierarchy, um, that some people are worth more than others, that some people are untouchable. And the idea that as you're growing up, you learn that there is a ladder of human value and some people are at different rungs of it. That's a very different message to grow up with than no matter who you are, you have this inherent worth. And so even if you've been placed by something you don't control or understand higher up on that ladder, you could always fall down. There are always rungs below. You're constantly trying to determine and based on things that you may not fully control and understand, where you sit in a social status. And I believe that our society has really suffered from this core sense of not having, despite our rhetoric, a baseline understanding that all humans have value. And so we run and we chase and we look for signals all the time about how we sit and how we fit, about who belongs and who's out, how many likes we have, how much money we have, how close we are to power. It is in some ways an adolescent uh, consciousness. And right now, sadly, the person in the White House is um, really embodies that sort of fragile ego, the need to punch down all the time and to assert where he sits in the world, and has relied on our anxiety in the United States about our economic place in the world, right, as, as political decisions have made um, it much harder to just have a working class job be a job that feeds your family and provides some security, He's traded on that anxiety, which is very real, um, to sort of reassert a need for everyone in his orbit to have someone, some other, to define themselves against. So when I think about what really needs to change, it's not tolerance, right? Because you can tolerate someone who's lower on the ladder than you are, right? In fact, like, you kind of want them around so you know where you are. Um, but we need to get to a place where there's a real, that's a pretty radical idea, but other societies have done it, just belief and acceptance of the fact that we're all 
worthy. Mm. Mm. You know, I, um, I like the word tolerance, and I, I feel at this particular moment in the U.S., uh, tolerance would be an aspirational goal. A little, <laughs> a little bit okay, more of where touche. we are. <laughs> and as a... Uh, you know, liber libertarians always struggle to ex explain what exactly they are. Gary Johnson said, I'm, I'm fiscally conservative and socially liberal. I don't think that really captures it. Mm -hmm. Others have said fiscally responsible and socially tolerant. And, and the thing I like about tolerance, and I, I happen to think that the U.S. does pretty well when it comes to tolerating different points of view, is it, it goes to my core philosophy. Um, I love it when people come together in community, community and voluntary association because that's where the good stuff comes from. But part of that is being able to opt out. Maybe I don't wanna be part of that project or that group or that business or that church, and, and that's cool too. Um, we, have to, we have to get to tolerance before we can get to what I think is, a, is, is even more aspirational, which is respect, mutual respect, mm -hmm. understanding that just because you don't go to the same church I do, that's okay. And I, I'm trying to understand where you're coming from. Um, to me, that's, uh, Liberty does that better because you never want to have a five to four vote in a congressional subcommittee that's going to decide that one side wins and the other side loses. I think voluntary cooperation, and particularly at the local level where we're looking each other in the eye, this is how you solve really complicated problems. Um, and if you, if you try to replace that with a one-size-fits-all top-down solution, um, it leads to the kind of resentment politics that we're living through today. You, you have spoken of something that, um, uh, that there's such a thing as bleeding heart libertarianism. Yes. Which, which also seems to me to be something uh, a little more than mere tolerance. Yes. Oh, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, I, I grew up uh, reading Ayn Rand, and she, if the, the caricature of Ayn Rand is this individualistic person that doesn't care about anybody else, and, and she actually talked about the virtue of, of selfishness, and, and if if you haven't read her, you, you don't even understand what that is. And libertarians have always been guilty of emphasis on individual freedom. Um, but I'm also a student of, of Hayek and, and, and a lot of really interesting social scientists who talk about the power of community and how it is that, that, that the, the evolution of community and, and individual cooperation creates rules that say don't hurt people and don't take their stuff. And this is not, it's not because somebody a long time ago passed a law, it's because people working through their differences actually came up with, with a common set of understandings about how we could get along with each other. And to me, that, that, that's essential to understanding how we're gonna get out of some of the problems we have today. But libertarians are so guilty of de-emphasizing the importance of community, um, de-emphasizing the, the potential of the value of helping other people because the way, the way we're safe in society is not by buying more guns, it's by counting on your neighbor not to hurt you. And so it's kind of a thing. So this, I think Matt's point, um, as I was listening to you, um, I was contrasting what you are saying and frankly what I've known from you know growing up and having libertarians in my school and in my community and among my friend groups um, with the sort of rhetoric and ideology and philosophy of the sort of professional libertarians in Congress, um, which really, I mean, and we saw it on display this week with the healthcare debate, it, it was hard to say that um, when put into legislation what is you know sort of currently rewarded as the political winners who are professional libertarians, right? So I maybe put it, um, you know, are not actually trying to legislate 
you know, the, the value of selfishness and, you know, taking out maternity coverage and just basically saying that the problem with healthcare is that it's sick, uh, healthy people paying for the sick, which of course is like insurance, period. I mean, we're all healthy <laughs> at some point, we're all sick at some point. But so this goes to, I think, one of the things that um, I think maybe, Christy, you were saying sort of unites the way we, who both of us have worked in and outside of politics, think about what the big challenge is right now, which is that ordinary people who may subscribe to um, certain political labels often have much more in common with each other than the elected officials who subscribe to those labels. And um, I think about it particularly in terms of yeah. um, some of the sort of core issues around you know, how much economic security we want and what we're willing to do to get it and make sure that families are okay. Um, there's much more of a gulf between the two sides of the aisle in Congress than there is between you know, the person with the Hillary lawn sign and the person with the Trump lawn sign. Um, and I think that it, in terms of you know, the critique of our politics, I, I testified in the Senate Judiciary Committee on Thursday against um, Donald Trump's uh, nominee for the Supreme Court, Neil Gorsuch, on money and politics grounds. And we did, um, because he would, he would be with the sort of Citizens United Caucus on the court, and we did a poll uh, with some partners that showed that 91% of Trump voters wanted him to uh, have a nominee to the Supreme Court who would be open to limiting big money in politics. Mm. 91%. Right. And of course, that makes sense if you remember the sort of rhetoric of the campaign. But as I sat there being questioned, there was no one on the Republican side yeah. who was anti-Citizens United. I mean, it was a very clear partisan divide. The Republicans were for no, um, uh, for, for what the Supreme Court has done to our political uh, system and the Democrats were against it. And it just felt like so often the biggest divide is between, you know, those in the halls of power and out as opposed yeah. to those on the left and the right. Right. It re and it really gets to what you say also, Matt, that this false, this simplification of everything that is our official discourse, it's the way we debate issues, um, it's the way we, we choose um, leaders. <laughs> um, I want to experiment a little bit here with the two of you. Um, I have uh, Francis Kissling, a, a name some people here may know, has, uh, gave, gave me a gift of a, a pair of questions. So she, she was for many years um, a very renowned pro-choice advocate. She's the head of Catholics for Choice. Um, and when she left Catholics for Choice, she gave herself over to figuring out what it would mean to be in real relationship with her political opposites. Um, and she, she has two questions that she says, um, if you can get to, that, that normally you would have to, you have to get to this place, right? Most of our public spaces where we talk about hard things are not trustworthy, right? We wouldn't, it's really not safe or reasonable to ask people to be vulnerable and open. Um, but the questions are, um, and I actually think because the two of you have been in conversation before, and I think this is a safe, trustworthy space, um, she says, you know, if you're really starting to engage difference, can you get to the point where you can, where you can, have a, where you can discuss out loud um, what can you see that is good in the position of the other, and what troubles you about your own position, the position of your group? Mm -hmm. And I feel like you, we've already wandered into that territory, but I'd love to... Um, to see what happens if we, if I just ask each of you to say a little bit about that. So I don't know, maybe Matt, why don't you start? Um, what do you see that is good in the position of the other? Obviously, the position of the other is a. We're not talking about just one issue, um, but what you know, what is good and what troubles you about your own position? So I, I think there's there's a fundamental truth uh, in what Hillary Clinton was trying to say when she said it takes a village, and I think. Um, the progressive side is stronger in the sense that they're they're trying to defend the community and they 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 care about everybody in that community and that's that's part of of their narrative that I think is so compelling and and our side and and Heather just said this you know the libertarians in Congress to you at least sound like um, they don't care and I th I think it's far more complicated than that and and we would of course argue that 
government-run programs don't deliver on the on the promises that mm. they make quite often. But but I th I think we have to be better at proving that that liberty is a great way to care for the least disadvantaged people. Mm -hmm. You know, and I wonder when you so your Twitter handle is got no signs or dividing lines and very few rules to guide. <laughs> and your book is called Don't Hurt People and Don't Take Their Stuff. And um, but I guess a question that raises for me, and I think you were, you were pointing at this also, is uh, given the fact that, that human beings are very strange, complicated creatures, you know, do, do you, do, does there need to be a modicum of freedom and safety that's guaranteed somehow? Um, before that level of freedom will produce the beneficial results for everybody that 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 you desire. Well, I, I think the American experiment is is premised on the idea that there are some some fundamental rights guaranteed to us in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, and 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 those those are very important to Tea Partiers and constitutional conservatives and, and libertarians. Um, but th those are negative rights. It's the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's not the right to an affordable health care plan or a college education. And, and those, are, those are fundamentally different things, and that's a lot what the two sides argue about. Can you actually use a top-down approach to provide positive rights to all of this other stuff? Um, but I, I would take it a step back and, 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 and lean on on Frederick Hayek again, and, and the, the got no signs or dividing lines is actually a quote from the Grateful Dead. I should make the appropriate religious <laughs> thing okay, right now. Good. Yeah. Um, Saint Jerry, of course, <laughs> saying that first. Um, but it's really, it, it really, the reason it's up there is it, it goes back to, to um, libertarian um, discussions on the, the evolution of civil society and how that happened, and it wasn't planned. It wasn't somebody saying, hey, we're gonna suddenly get along and stop killing each other and, and invading each other's countries. It was a, it was a natural evolution of, of people with no rules or signs. And it, to me, it feels a little bit like uh, hanging out in the parking lot of a Grateful Dead concert. Um, nobody, nobody- It's not an experience I've had. Any, anybody ever been to a Dead show? <laughs> Back me up here. It's, it's, a, <laughs> it's a cool, spontaneous community where by and large um, people get along and, and they don't hurt people or take their stuff. Mm. And to me, that's, that's what the market is. That's what spontaneous order is all about. It's, it's about people figuring out how to cooperate in a way that respects the rights of everybody in, in a sense that everybody is tolerant of everybody else. And out of that comes a mutual respect and a, and a sense that it's not just my life and, and, and my stuff that matters, it's the guy next to me and it's the guy down the street, and, and you get that only from, from peaceful cooperation. When you, when, you, when you come in from the outside, and the outside might feel like Washington, D.C., to the real Washington here, do we really want the Trump administration deciding whether or not um, your drug policy here is a good idea? I hope, by the way, to, to pivot a little bit, I hope we can have a, a conversation about the imperial presidency and, and abusive executive power. And I, I, would, I would globally replace every criticism I had of Barack Obama and put Donald Trump in there and, and argue that this, you never want one person to have that much authority. It's dangerous and, and it, it's, it's corrosive to community and civil society. I also hear you saying, I think the freedom, the freedom that you um, that you passionately believe in is a freedom for as much as a freedom from. Um, Heather, mm -hmm. what you see that is good in the position of the other, what troubles you about your own position, the position of your group? Yeah. So I think that we would never be at the place where we are with um, progress on de decriminalization of drugs and um, more broadly, uh, criminal justice reform and a, a step back from the terrible uh, scourge of mass incarceration without libertarians. Um, 
as Michelle Alexander writes so beautifully in The New Jim Crow, um, the mass incarceration state was one that was created and promulgated really based on um, you know, racial injustice. And the libertarian movement, which is so um, you know, predominantly, at least in my experience of it, white men, for them to join and say, you know what, this is not the system that we want, that was an extremely powerful intervention that it wasn't just um, communities of color saying, stop this. It was then the people who were part of the, um, you know, kind of political and uh, institutional system that really drove um, uh, mass incarceration um, saying, you know what, this isn't good for the whole country and our philosophy about liberty uh, demands that we put an end to this. And, and I will fully acknowledge um, that it was a bipartisan uh, consensus to develop mass incarceration in this country. So um, that's something that I'm very thankful to the libertarian movement for, and I think we're going to continue to see great progress. Um, and I know you, Matt, personally care a lot about that. In terms of um, our side as progressives, what troubles me, we are a really big tent, right? I mean, you have to have, um, you know, like the sort of Oregon tree hugger and the, you know, undocumented abuela and the person who cares about um, marijuana decriminalization and the person who wants to break up the banks and, um, you know, the lesbian who just wants to get married and have a nice house. I mean, it's really quite a big tent um, and, you know, grows ever more so as the, um, you know, as the, the, the polls get stronger and, and stronger on the right as well. Um, I think that our side, um, as broad as that is, um, let me just say the Democratic Party, let me put it that way so it's kind of simpler, has not really contended with the divides on our side, with the fact that you can be um, you know, basically tolerant uh, be a Democrat, but still have a view about the economy because it benefits you, that puts you um, at odds with someone who is working two jobs and sleeping in their car in between on a clopening, as mm -hmm. they're called now. Um, that there is a cry in the Fergusons of the country, which are in every state, truly, whether it's Native American or African-American or Latino or poor rural whites um, that is just not being heard by the tr truly, in terms of the amount of transformative change that is needed um, by the people who are currently sort of calling the shots and setting the policy agenda on our side. Um, so I think that there's a lot of um, work to do in our own house on the left. Mm -hmm. And this moment of exile when, you know, very few state houses and all three branches of government uh, are not what we need to be busy governing in, um, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of work to do. This is a way, I mean, this is, this is going a little farther down one of the roads that flows out of that, um, a way you've written about this that I found very, um, good and challenging. So the left will have to challenge its own orthodoxy that defines racism as something that wholly benefits whites and solely victimizes people of color. The truth is, in the post-war era, racism helped create the white middle class. Since the Reagan era, racism has helped destroy it. There's complexity for you. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, so that uh, that line is from an article that I co-wrote with Ian Haney Lopez, who's a um, Demo senior fellow and my my law professor professor um, when I was in law school. Um, which the title of it uh, sort of limits it. <laughs> it was how populists like Bernie Sanders should talk about racism. It was written during the uh, primary last year when we had this very odd phenomenon where you had this, you know, full-throated, fiery populist who was saying all the things that we've been saying at Demos about the economy and inequality and the way that the game has been rigged and the deck has been stacked, um, but mostly 
only talking about race as sort of a yes and things are worse for people of color. And then you had the deeply intersectional, you know, everybody in, make the list of, you know, every concern um, campaign of Hillary Clinton that was not nearly as sharp as it needed to be, I think, on, you know, the concentration of wealth and power in this country. And it felt like such a missed opportunity for a progressive narrative to have, in some ways, the beautiful, expansive we that President Obama painted and uh, excited in his campaigns with the them of the 1% of Occupy and Bernie Sanders. And I believe, um, and at Demos we've really been focusing on this question, that race has been the weapon that has been used in the class war to divide Americans from one another to alienate um, white voters, particularly from government, by t tying government to undeserving minorities in the popular imagination. And that's been a very deliberate strategy um, by the sort of pro-corporate uh, right wing um, ever since LBJ signed the Civil Rights Act. It's known as the Southern Strategy. Um, since LBJ signed the Civil Rights Act, no Democrat has gotten the majority of the white vote. This um, question of who belongs, who really is an American, and what do we owe to one another, is, I think, the most important question of our time. It is challenging to create a social contract that would provide for a decent standard of living for everyone when the everyone is not only diverse by race and ethnicity and origin, but also is painted with our dominant narratives in our popular culture and particularly um, in the sort of rising white nationalist media as bad, undeserving, lazy at best, criminal at worst. And we have got to contend with the implicit bias that virtually all of us have against people of color, against immigrants, and the deliberately stoked bias that is being created and used as, as a weapon to divide us from one another when we have so much work to do together in this country to rebuild the middle class, to protect the planet that we've inherited, um, and to keep the experiment of democracy going for another generation. So, so I feel like what is being unfolded, what, what you're giving voice to up here is a very different narrative from, you know, the sky is falling, from what's in the New York Times today, um, from what's on Fox News today. This is the story, the story of our time is so much bigger and more complicated um, than you know, the narrative, the official narratives, whatever that means, and it's not clear, I don't know, I don't even know what I mean when I say that, except I know what I experience. So I guess I wanna ask as we, as we draw to a close, um, obviously I think everybody in this room is living the new narrative, right? Making it happen. Um, you know, what's not gonna happen is that, is that you know, there's that amazing scene in, Alice Shrugged, where John Galt takes over all the airwaves of Earth for 70 pages, right? <laughs> and I remember reading that, and you know, and but the thing is, even if John, even if that could happen now, and it actually could happen now, it, that's that wouldn't make the difference. Um, where where would you where are you looking? What are you reading? What are you listening to? How do you uh, encourage all you know other people to? to walk through the world experiencing a truer, harder, bigger narrative. Matt, do you, you want to? You know, the, the irony of uh, 
John Galt is that it's almost everything that we don't believe in. It's almost like there's this benevolent uh, dictator that's going to step in and <laughs> solve everything all that our... libertarians don't, be right. don't believe in. Yeah, and it's it's utterly contrary to what we supposedly right. believe. And I think I think one of the upsides of of Trump, and I, I'm I'm a student of of public choice theory, which is um, this idea that if you really want to understand how politics and public policy works, you need to appreciate that politicians and, and public servants are just as self-interested as the rest of us. And that's where you get all sorts of distortions in public policy. You get uh, the collusion between big government and big business and, and the bizarre outcomes that are utterly contrary to what everyone understands to be the public good. But that's the way it is. And so what, what I'm looking for and, and why I think community is so important to talk about today, and maybe it sounds different than, than what libertarians in Washington are talking about, is that I don't, I don't expect Washington to solve our problems. I think we're going to have to do it from the bottom up, and I think that politics is a lagging indicator of social change. So we got to Trump based on things that happened in the past, and if you want to fix the future, um, I at least have, have tried to step away from politics. It's a little bit like the mm -hmm. precious. Once you put it on, you, it's hard to take off again, but... You, you got to get away from politics because it's, 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 it's corrupting these conversations. I think we're going to have to solve things from the bottom up, mm -hmm. and it's going to involve people that think they hate each other to actually sit down and say, okay, what's, how, do we, how do we work this out? Because the revolution's coming, and the old systems are breaking down, and if we don't figure out how to solve these things, even though we think we disagree with each other, we're going to end up with more Trumps. And that's just the way it's going to be, and that that's bad populism. And the and the trend line there, we can we can look in history and see where where that kind of stuff goes. Mm -hmm. But the alternative is all of this upside of of people understanding each other. And and where do you take that in, like online or going to conventions like this? I mean, where where do you point? Where do you see that? Where is that visible? Well, I I think the the economics of social media make it compelling. I think the the problem we all have today is that our audience is much bigger than we appreciate. And, and so I, I, think, I think getting into the popular culture um, focused on storytelling and video is how you do it. Mm -hmm. If it's a political campaign, everybody's gonna go back to their camps and start yelling at each other. Right. If it's about a common American value, people from all over the place are, are going to be nodding their head yes, and then they're gonna look over and realize that the person that is also nodding their head yes is that guy that they're supposed to hate that's how you do it. Okay. So, um, you know, I had this this um, viral video experience. Right, Gary um, from North Carolina. <laughs> Gary from North Carolina. <laughs> yeah. It was not the cat videos that I watch a lot. It was uh, this really <laughs> unexpected moment when I was on C-SPAN. Um, this man called in and said, hi, I'm Gary from North Carolina. Uh, I'm a white male and I'm prejudiced. And he went on to explain sort of why and, and offer up a bunch of stereotypes. But then he ended and he said, but I, I want to change. How do I change and become a better American? And um, I thanked him and I bought the top of my head, gave him some thoughts basically about how to sort of integrate his life. Um, and then, you know, we went on to 10 other calls. It was just a call-in show. Um, but it, the clip went on Facebook and a million people saw it over the course of the weekend and it was sort of took off from there. And I ended up getting a chance to um, talk to Gary on the phone. Uh, he found me on Twitter. His first tweet was, um, how does this thing work? Um, There's that healing internet again. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I had a chance a few weeks later, we talked a few times. I was astonished to learn that he had really taken my kind of off the top of my head advice to heart and set on a path that would ultimately really transform his life. And he went from being a man who was, you know, telling racist jokes and had a kind of avowed prejudiced beliefs and fears and anxieties, particularly about African Americans, to um, becoming a real friend of mine and someone who reads, you know, the new Jim Crow and Cornell West and um, and this was all in the past like six months um, and um, Gary does something that I think is really powerful and anyone can do and I want to maybe leave with this advice from Gary if I can 
uh, uh, share this. He created this little system where he would um, see a person in the waiting room at the VA, at the gas station, in line at the store, and if it was a person of color, he would sort of note to himself how, um, what his immediate reactions were, what he thought just at the first uh, momentary impression, how kind of intimidating or um, scary they were. And then he would force himself to say something to that person. Oh, the traffic was really bad. You know, when's this line going to move? How's the weather? I mean, you know, banal stuff. And get into a conversation. It wasn't always easy, depending on the person. Um, and then he would think again in sort of like a sliding scale of how much less intimidating uh, that person seemed or frightening or anxiety producing after having had a basic everyday conversation. This practice um, has been something that, you know, Gary has then done by really creating more relationships in his life across difference. And that's not the answer to institutional racism and structural racism and the deep economic divides and all of that, but it is a part of the healing that is necessary for those of us who live in a system that is hardwired to do exactly what it was set up to do, um, to be a part of the change. And I've been so inspired by having Gary in my life um, to show me kind of the simple things we can do when we turn off the news and turn to the people in our neighborhoods um, and just ask them, how are you doing? But, but you know, it, it's also very sophisticated what's happened there, right? I mean, he's changing his brain, in mm -hmm. fact. Mm -hmm. In fact, he is re-engineering, re you know, he's his, his rewiring. That's right. Um, so, I mean, I think it's, a, it's an amazing story, and we're out of time, and I wish we could keep going. I, was it Thoreau who talked about how we contain multitudes? <laughs> um, I, think, I think it's something that's really come through to me in this is, you know, the, the, the greatest antidote to reducing everything absurdly to two sides is, is actually engaging another human being because each of us contains multitudes. So here with the two of you, we've had much more than two sides presented. And you know, the story of Gary and the story of all of us and all these, all, every meaningful exchange any of us has had like this, is, is there so, so much more complexity. Um, and uh, I thank you for embodying that and for a wonderful conversation. Thank you, Krista. Thank you. Thank you.